Okay, folks, let's get started. I am. <laughs> I have a prayer request from one of our folks uh, for the family of Jason Green. They're members at North Jacksonville Baptist Church. Uh, died yesterday, been battling leukemia for quite some time. So if you know that family or pray for Jason Green's family. Some of our folks are some of our folks are still in the hospital. Uh, pray for them. Some of them are going through some deep water. Others are getting well, and we're grateful for that. All right, let's have a word of prayer together and we'll get started. We commit the time to you, Heavenly Father, that we'll study today, and I trust that out of our study there will come some deeper understanding about how we are to live and how we are to grow in Christ, what we are to do with our life and our time and our commitment to the Lordship of Jesus. Make us keenly sensitive and aware of those things that we need to learn, those things that we need to do. I pray, Father, that you would help us, that you would bless us in this day. Bless our singing as we come to the end of the time and have with Paul and Annette. Bless that time together. There's nothing quite like singing the songs of Zion. Nothing quite like singing the great theology of the hymns. So I pray your blessings today. Bless this time together, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you do remember, yes, we remember, no Bible study next week, no Bible study on the 4th, that's our spring break. <laughs> Everybody takes a spring break, we'll take one too, one day, spring break. All right, let's look at review sheet number 16, Life in Christ, F. It is now and forever, future and present. We don't have to wait until we die to know that we have eternal life. We can know it now. Number two, human love. H, responds to divine love. Human love responds to divine love. Number three, Jesus. I, make a new relationship to God, a new relationship to God. I'm no longer lost. I'm saved. I'm saved. And all that that means. Number four, Holy Spirit, G, lives in us. Lives in us. Number five, God, A, is love. God is love. Number six, Jesus saves from J, wrath. The lamb becomes the lion, the wrath of God. Now, that's God's other nature or foreign nature. God's nature is to love. But sometimes the anger. I just finished the last of Judges on taping. I never cease to amaze that Israel would go through cycle after cycle. Sin, then the scripture uses the word in Judges, God sold his people into captivity. He gave them up to captivity to teach them a lesson. They never did learn. Came out of captivity, same cycle. They sinned, God sold them, they cried out, God saved them, they sinned, the whole cycle goes through. 16 judges, I'm sorry, 12 judges, six major, six minor, all of them, same thing, the cycle. All right, I'll get off that. Number seven, B, others see God in us. Others see God 
in us. Number eight, propitiation, C. It's God's mercy seat for us. Number nine, God's love, D, is undeserved, is undeserved. And number 10, love, E, originates in God, originates in God. Any question on the matching? All right. Number two, love explains. I gave you a list of things. Explains creation, human responsibility, providence. Now be sure, make a slash there. You always know providence in the rear view mirror. You never know providence out in front of you. It's always when you look back, you realize God's providence was in all of this. I remember when I was putting this together, I remembered a time in Sulphur Springs, Texas, that I was on my way to the hospital to see someone. I pulled up at a light in this small town, pulled up at a light, somebody, church member, standing on the corner, rolled down my window, said hello. We talked talk for a while. Nobody behind me had just stayed at the light and talked for a while. Not, not a long time. Maybe two minutes, no more. If I had been traveling two minutes earlier, I would have been in the biggest wreck that they'd ever seen in Sulphur Springs. That two minutes kept me out of the wreck. Now, I didn't know that at the time. I just thought I was outing with a friend. Never saw him on that corner again. He's on that corner that day. Now, some would say, that's so coincidental. That's not coincidence. That's God's providence. God's providence. And I'm glad. God's providence. Explains creation, free will, or human responsibility. Providence. Number four, redemption. God chose his method of redemption. Don't try to explain everything God does. Why would you want to serve a God you could explain? I can't even explain you. And you can't even explain me. We think we can. We take a shot at it every now and then. Nancy and I were married 65 years. I guarantee you, I could not explain her after 65 years. Sometimes it was just a surprise. Surprise. So, redemption, God's chosen plan. Number five, life beyond. God gives us heaven. Life beyond. God gives us heaven. All right, any question on number two? Number three, fill in the blanks. When love comes, fear goes. When love comes, fears go. Number two, love for God and love for man cannot be dissolved. God's going to love us whether we love him or not. It cannot be dissolved. And number three, I left a word out. We are never nearer or closer to God than when we love. We are never nearer to God than when we love. Now, isn't that interesting? 
You'd yeah. think we'd be closer to God when we pray. We're closest to God when we love. For God is love. Number four, love has two relationships. When we are learning to love God, we are learning love from God. Love has two relationships. When we are learning, when we're learning to love God, we are learning love from God. And number five is my candid and theological opinion. Everything can be overcome by love. Everything can be overcome by love. All right, any questions? All right, turn please to the fourth chapter of 1 John and we'll begin our study. 1 John chapter 4. Now, when we left last time, I think I had given you the qualities of Jesus, but I'm not sure. Did I give you the qualities of Jesus? He is merciful. There's five of them. Five qualities of Jesus. He is merciful. What does the psalmist say in the 23rd Psalm? Every time I look behind me. What do I see? I see mercy. That's providence. I see the mercy of God. Mercy. He is forgiving. He is forgiving. He is righteous. He is righteous. He is kind. Number four, he is kind. He is loving. Number five. Now he's going to talk about this thing of love and fear. Let me just make one candid statement. And see if I can prove it. There is an imperfection in our faith when we constantly are afraid. Now let me say that again. We are or we have a, an imperfection. We have an imperfection in our faith when we are constantly afraid afraid. Now I'm going to talk about fear and faith and how the two are, two are in opposition to each other. Fear destroys, or I should say fear can destroy and make us less than God expects. Fear can destroy and make us less than God expects. We diminish our own potential when we live by fear rather than by faith. Let me say that again. I'm going to try to prove these to you as well from the scripture. I'm just not making this up as I go along. We, we need to know and to understand that when we are afraid, when we are afraid, we are diminishing our own potential. When we live by faith, we are growing in our own potential as the children of God when we live by faith. Listen to a passage in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6. Matthew, chapter 6, part of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, verses 19 through 24. Chapter 6, verses 19 through 24. Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, 
where neither raw, uh, rust nor moth nor rust can corrupt, and where thieves cannot break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, your whole body will be filled with light. But if your eye is evil, then your whole body will be filled with darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. No man can serve two masters. He will either hate one and love the other, or hold to one, despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. That's the Sermon on the Mount. It's what Jesus wants us to learn. Now let's talk about types of fear. There's more than one kind of fear. I, I've jotted down. I, this is my understanding of fear. And probably I have gone through all of these stages. Fear. Number one, I think timidity or being timid is a type of fear. A type of fear. I just can't get up and speak in front of people. Scares me to death. Scares me too. <laughs> Scares me too. Every time I preach, every time, not necessarily, now I make a difference between teaching and preaching. What I'm doing this morning is teaching. If I start preaching, you'll know the difference. <laughs> I think there's a difference between the two. But when I am preaching, and I am just, I by faith believe that I could say something today that would change a life eternally, it scares me to death. I have the same feeling after almost 68 years of doing it that I had the first day I did it. Every time I leave the seat to go to the pulpit, I have that same rush that today lives could change. Now, the same thing is true by teaching. For me, preaching demands a more immediate decision than teaching. Teaching sometimes, you're, you're learning now the best part of what John's been trying to get to all along, that God is love, and we are most like God when we are loving like God. Taking people for who they are, not recasting them in our mind and refusing because this or that reason. No, when we are loving like God loves, we are most like him. John wants us to know that. I told you when we started the study, it's the you can know book of the Bible. 26 times, I believe, someone's counted for me. He talks about no, or you can know, or you must know. So, timidity, just afraid of anything or everything. I think Timothy, even his name lends itself. I think that's why Paul sent Titus to Corinth rather than Timothy. Timothy would have worn out his stomach trying to deal with the Corinthians. They were a tough crowd. They were a tough crowd. It seemed like Titus could handle just about anybody. I think it was Titus he sent first in 1 Corinthians. I'll have to look that up. If I'm wrong about that, forgive me. I think I'm correct. I once thought I was wrong, but I wasn't. <laughs> but anyhow... Timidity, afraid of this, afraid of that. Now, number two, fear in times of crisis. Who's the primary example in the Bible of someone who's a fear, who's afraid in the time of crisis? Simon Peter. <laughs> I never knew him. Don't blame him on me. Three times he denied the Lord. Third time he cursed. 
I don't know what that was all about. I guess he was exasperated. And as I told one fellow one time, I got so tired of listening to him, I said, if your vocabulary is awfully limited by the language you use. <laughs> you just have a limited vocabulary if you have to use that kind of language to explain yourself. He cursed. Because the crisis was, what was the crisis? <laughs> they may hang me on the tree beside him. That was the crisis. And you and I could say, oh, that would never happen to me. And I have one theological word for that. Baloney. <laughs> it could happen to you. And it might happen to you. And we may have to stand up and say, we do know him at the very risk of our lives. And we'll find out whether or not we really, as I, I keep referring back to because a marker in my life was the death of Nancy. That's a big marker in my life. I can't, I can't get away from it. And I remember at her funeral, there was a bunch of young preachers standing around. And I said to them, young men, when you come to this moment in your life, you understand as, as what I have been saying about Jesus is what I really believe. You know it in the moment of crisis. You know it in the moments of crisis. And I had no idea that when the two become one, and then you become one again, you have to find out who you are. It's so different. How do you explain life without the person you've lived, like, lived with 65 years? You are retooling yourself. Now, I'll get off of that. All of that to say, the crisis of life may cause us to fear rather than live by faith. Than by live by faith. All right, crisis, second kind of fear in times of crisis, Simon Peter. And then there is a conscious fear. One of mine, I know I am afraid of snakes. Nobody has ever had to tell me I was afraid of snakes. Amen. Still am. Still am. I can't imagine. I had a niece that had one of those, it was a boa constrictor, that thing was that big around, in the house. No way, Jose, not in my house. I am afraid of snakes. Now, they can say, well, this is a harmless snake. I have never seen a harmless snake <laughs> to me. Here's what happens. The snake doesn't hurt me, it makes me hurt myself. Yeah. That's what happens to me. That's what happens to me. Now, you may have a fear of something else, a, a phobia of something else. But I, I have a fear of snakes. I just don't want to be around them. Now, I know that if I had a little more faith, I, I might understand them, but I, I just have a fear of snakes. Do you have a fear of something? Whatever my, the, some folks have a fear of darkness. A lot of times children have a fear of darkness. They have a fear of darkness. They don't want to stay in their own bed in the dark. They want to be where mother is. Not necessarily where daddy is, but where mother is. It's an interesting thing. Our, our youngest child did not like to be alone if the weather was bad. And it wasn't unusual for us to wake up and she would be on the sleeping bag beside her mother's side of the bed. I said, never come on dad's side of the bed. I guess she's afraid he might get up during the night and squash me. <laughs> There's a fear. Some fear of darkness. Some fear of darkness. Some fear of other things. So in times of crisis, Simon Peter, a conscious fear that you might have. And then, fearing those in places of authority. 
when you're driving down the highway <laughs> and you're supposed to be going 70 and you are going 80, what are you constantly doing? Looking in your mirror. Because you're afraid a policeman might show up behind you and the red light would be. And I would always say, why is he stopping me? <laughs> the fear of authority. The fear of authority. Have any of you ever been on a jewelry? That's, that was one of the most enlightening times of my life. Then the, the other time I got chosen, I was the foreman of the jewelry. I was even worse. And I had this 20-year-old kid. I don't know how he ever got on. Uh, he didn't have, I, I was going to say didn't have sense enough. That's not right. He didn't have gumption enough to come in out of the rain. And he thought he knew it all. Until finally I said to him, you're too young to know that much. And he quieted down. And we tried the case. Found the man guilty. That was it. But fear of authority is sometimes a problem with some of us. Panic is a kind of fear. Panic. I was a volunteer fireman when I was pastor of the First Baptist Church of Alito, Texas, population 442. I was one of the firemen. I actually helped put out fires. This one fire, I was teaching high school at the same time. This high school kid that I was teaching went into the panic mode when she realized her house was on fire. She went into the panic mode. I like to never got her quieted down. Panic. Sometimes it's called a panic attack. Some of you had those panic attacks. Sometimes fear comes in the panic mode. Now the last one probably is the one we are most guilty of on a consistent basis. Worry. Worry is a type of fear. In my opinion, it's a type of fear. I call it nervous fear. Nervous fear. We worry about everything. Listen, folks. The longer we live and the more we get to know about Jesus Christ, the less we ought to worry about things. James said, you don't worry about things. You don't worry about things. Now, I'm not saying don't be concerned. There's a lot of difference being concerned and being worried about things. My grandmother would wear her knuckles out, worrying. Her knuckles were white most of the time, worrying about things. Now, she had some reasons to be worried. She had a mean husband, for one. And she had 13 children, for another. That's a reason to be worried. Just, if nothing else, just worry about how in the world am I going to get up in the morning. But her knuckles would be white. Because she would, and yet, she was one of the most dedicated believers that I've ever seen. And was one of the few examples I saw of Christianity growing up as a boy. But she worried about everything. I think I've told you the story. Last time I saw her, she slept with one foot on the floor. Remember that story? One foot on the floor. I said to her the next morning, Grandma, why do you sleep with one foot on the floor? Do you have some kind of 
feeling in your feet and you need the... She said, oh, no. Oh, no. I sleep with one foot on the floor in case I start to die. I want to get up and make my peace with God. I said, she said, now, don't, don't talk to me about that eternal stuff. Don't talk to me about once saved, always saved. She really believed that you could lose your salvation, and she wanted to be sure before she died she had it. Now, you and I have a hard time. On, I never did understand her, and the truth of the matter is she did not understand me, and so we just agreed we would talk about what we did understand about each other. Fear comes in many forms, many forms. Worry is probably the worst form. Now, have you, been going, have you gone down the road and there's a big sign, watch for fallen rocks? What could you do about it? <laughs> if they're falling, they're going to hit you. If they're already down, you're going to hit them. What, what could you do about falling rocks? My brother-in-law had his children convinced that was the name of an Indian. And every time they'd see it, they'd say, now look for the Indians, look for fallen rocks. <laughs> he has other problems too, so. <laughs> so fear comes in many ways. Probably you could add to my list. Let me just go through them again. Timidity, crisis, conscious fear, Fear of superiority, panic, worry, all of those things constitute fear. Now, then we come to a passage of Scripture like we find in Proverbs 1-7. In Proverbs 1-7, we come to an interesting place. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord is the beginnings of knowledge. You'll find that also in Psalm 11, 111, verse 10. Psalm 111, verse 10. But the beginning of wisdom. So look at this fear of God that he's talking about. What does he mean when we fear God? And that's the beginning of wisdom. Well, one thing, it is just that. The psalmist begins the psalm, I am convinced, with rationale. When the first psalm said, blessed is the man that. He wants us to understand that the blessings of God are dependent on certain things. Blessed is the man that. Does not take instruction from those he shouldn't take instruction. He doesn't stand in the way of sinners. He doesn't sit in the seat of the scoffer. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. As a result, he shall be like a tree planted by the living waters that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and here's the kicker, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. What's the next line? The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor in the counsel of the righteous, God knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. You follow that theme, and wherever you go in the book of Psalms, you will find something leading back to Psalm 1, the instructive psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. That's what he told me in Psalm 1. I shall not want. That's what he told me in Psalm 1. Everything I do shall prosper. Does that mean I'm going to have money in my pocket? Not necessarily, but it might. 
It might. Prosperity comes in more than one way. And so as a result, it all goes back to Psalm 1. I think that's foundational to all of the other Psalms. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast ordained strength because of your enemies that you might still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider the heavens which thy hands have made, the moon and stars which thou hast ordained, what is a man that you are mindful of him? That is a logical question. That God loves us And the Son of Man, that you visited him, made him just a little lower. He's talking about Jesus. Made him just a little lower than the angels, crowned him with honor and glory. Thou madest him to have dominion over the work of your hands. You have put all things under your feet, sheep, oxen, beasts of the field, fowl of the air, fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is Thy name in all the earth. So when we come to think about what God wants out of us in the sphere of the Lord, we come back to the Psalms and we understand in Psalm 1 the foundation for all that he's going to talk about. Number 2, Proverbs 8, 13. I'm not going to look these up. I'll let you do that at your own risk. The secret of uprightness. The secret of uprightness is in the fear of the Lord. Number three, Ecclesiastes 13, 13. Helps us to keep God's commands. The fear of the Lord helps us to keep God's commands. Now, that's the same thing we do with our children, is it not? I remember my dad, one time, only one time in my life, did my father spank me. Well, that's putting it mildly. He whooped me. (laughs) Hardest spanking I ever had in my life. Do you know what he did? He didn't do it because he didn't like me. He did it because I lied to him. And he knew that that had to be broken. And he broke it real fast. (laughs) Never lied to my dad again in all of his lifetime. Wouldn't even cross my mind to lie to him again. Now some of you are saying, surely you didn't spank your children. I did. (laughs) Dr. Spock. I did spank my children. And all three of them are productive individuals. All of their five children are productive individuals. And I have nine grandkids. If I have my way, they'll be productive individuals. So this teaches us to keep the command of God. Number four. It helps control our walk in Christ. It helps control our walk in Christ. Proverbs 1.8 again. In the last, it stimulates toward holiness. 2 Corinthians 7.1. It stimulates toward holiness. Now, we can only have holiness because God is holy. That's not our nature. Holiness comes from God. That's not our nature. And we know who we are. And we know what our nature is. And we know where we have to fear this because it leads us to know God. In the beginning, fear 
of God is the beginning of wisdom. We understand that. So those five things, the beginning of wisdom, the secret of uprightness, keeping the commands, walking in Christ, and stimulates toward holiness. Now, Christ revealed all of this attitude to us on the cross. All of this attitude. The cross was a former, a formal, F-O-R-M-A-L, a formal transaction of God to you and me. It's a formal transaction. It is complete. It is a once for all, never to be duplicated transaction of God toward man. Calvary will never happen again. Never happen again. Now resurrection will happen again for you and for me. It will happen again. And it will happen again for... We're coming up on Easter. I love Easter because I love preaching about the resurrection. I love, I think I've told you, that everybody, well, you want to be raptured or you want to be out of the grave? I want to kick off, I want to kick off the clods and go up. I, I don't want to be raptured. I want to kick off the clods. Death is conquered by resurrection. Lazarus had to die again. In fact, if you read closely, when Jesus went back to his house and they had dinner together, Guess what was being plotted? Not only how to kill Jesus, but how to kill Lazarus. Because a lot of folks were believing because of the resurrection of Lazarus. But listen, Lazarus had to die again. Jesus never has had to die again. He's still alive in the world today. Now when we understand that, and that begins to take place in that, this is a formal transaction for you and for me. A once for all, never to be duplicated transaction. Well, I'm going to stop there because that's where I'm supposed to stop. <laughs>